You're tuned in to Fitness and Consciousness. Today's episode is called The Midget and the Man. I'm going to tell the story of um, how I came up with the title. And I'm going to talk about the time that I met the professional wrestler, Diamond Dallas Page. And I'm going to talk about Ram Das. I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. I'm going to read a little bit of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And I'm going to read something else also. Not very much of either one of them. We'll see how it goes. If you tune into the show very often, you know I have my outline of what the show will be. But for the most part, I just uh, let it rip and, and see what happens. Uh, I'm trying to always push my thinking and I'm kind of sort my thoughts out. Or I'm still in the process of sorting my thoughts out as I'm speaking. I don't really have, uh, I don't read from a script except from the books. And uh, speaking of the books, I thought it might be interesting to show some of the books that I'm reading, obviously there's books that I literally read from, but I'm, I'm usually reading some, I, I probably have like 50 th things out from the library, 40 to 50 things out on a regular basis. And a lot of them are audio books that I don't have to uh, show here. But uh, one of them that I just got is called, um, I use it to prop my microphone up. That's why I had the idea. Um, the Path of Modern Yoga by Elliot Goldberg. And it's going to be just what it sounds like. And uh, The Gift of Injury by Dr. Stuart McGill. He's been on the podcast. And so I use a couple books to prop up my microphone. And so maybe uh, some of the shows I'll just uh, tell you what's propping up my mic. Uh, these are good sizes, though, so I, I might just keep saying the same one over and over again. So anyways, the show is called The Midget and the Man. It was probably the year 2003, 2004, something like that. And I was with a buddy of mine that I worked with and I met him, you know, I was a, a, a personal trainer from 1999 until 2001, late 2001. And then I started selling lawn care. I've told a little bit about that story before. And I don't want to dig too much into that, but I started selling lawn care and I, I met my buddy Josh when I was, um, working at the lawn care place. We were both salesmen. And so it was the year 2003, 2004. And we were driving, and this is in Indianapolis. He was driving and we were by, um, there's a popular trail called the Monon Trail. And it used to be train tracks. And it was uh, paved and turned into like a bike trail, running trail. And it's uh, it's very popular. It goes um, from, I think a little bit south of downtown. I'm not sure how far south it goes. And then like way into the next town north of here called Carmel. And uh, it's used by a lot of people. And so we're driving and we get to the part at 75th and Westfield Boulevard. And that's where this like bunch of wood starts. There's like wooded trails off of this part. And there's this guy on a, a bike and he's riding kind of towards us. I think we're, we're stopped at this stoplight headed south. And so he's coming from the west and he's riding his bike and he kind of like jumps like the kind of does like a wheelie thing jumping over this little hill and uh, 
he he just has the biggest smile on his face. He looked like he was just in bliss. He he was just it's a nice day. He's on his bike. He's having a good time. He was by himself. And what my buddy saw was a midget on a mini bike. And he pointed and he laughed. And at that moment, the guy looked up and over at my buddy, saw him pointing and laughing and that big smile and all that joy was just crushed. And he didn't make eye contact with me. And so I wasn't laughing. I, I didn't think it was funny. Of course, I could see the scene. And, I, you know, I, the like politically correct term is a little person, I'm pretty sure. So I said midget because that is a provocative thing. So that's what my buddy saw. He saw a midget. But I saw the little person. I'm not trying to sound like I'm, you know, so righteous or or whatever. But so that's why I say the word midget. It's It's supposed to be. Uh, provocative. It's supposed to get your attention and be insulting and offensive. It's that's why I said it. So the guy was riding a kid's bike because he was a little person. So that's the the size bike that fits him and. No, I was thinking about that, and this was, you know, 14 years ago, 15 years ago. And I can still see his face. I can still see that guy's face go from bliss to just crushed just because some, some goober pointed and laughed at him. And then I, I was thinking, you know, preparing for this show. And seeing how I was going to put these different things together that I was thinking of. You know, so he, he's on a, a, a kid's bike. Okay. Because it, it fits him. But also I was thinking about, well, what was his childhood like? You know, even as an adult, he still has people making fun of him. So imagine the ridicule and maybe it was, you can imagine, you know, when, when we're kids, it's usually, you know, we're at school, it's not so hard to make friends and some people have a harder time than others. And I would imagine that being a little person would make things difficult. And the ridicule that he would receive on a daily basis would kind of like ruin the childhood, wouldn't it? And so here he is as an adult. He was he looked like he was in his thirties, mid thirties or so. I'm not I'm not sure how how old he was, but it looked like he was at least in his thirties. And so here he is, he gets a chance to kind of be a kid. He's on a kid bike, but that I mean, cause that's what fits, but also he's just having fun. He's just in this joyous state and he's like doing a wheelie and he's jumping and he's just tearing it up on this bike. And then it's all ruined by this dude. And I haven't seen him in a long time. Uh, we we weren't friends for a really long time, and it's it's not just because I'm you know so much more righteous or something like that. I I, it, I don't even remember what it was. Just like one of those things that fell away. So I, I wonder, you know, if if at that moment. 
when, you know, before when he's riding his bike and he's having fun and, you know, he probably just came out of the woods or he was doing whatever it was. He was having just the time of his life. And then some random guy in a car pointing and laughing took that, took that away. And I would imagine he probably didn't regain that same level of joy for, well, who knows how long. But I would think it would take a while. And, you know, I wonder if Josh, the that buddy of mine, I wonder if he still thinks of that as a, a, this funny thing. Oh, he saw this midget on a mini bike. It was hilarious. He was popping a wheelie. And re- I wonder if he thinks like that or if he thinks, man, that was actually a, a really jerk move for me. Now, I don't remember saying anything about it. I didn't laugh along with him. And I don't remember saying anything to him about it. I think a lot of us are probably are made fun of to some degree. You know, some of us are our friends make fun of us. And um, I think to some degree that can be healthy, you know, like guys just joking around. Um, You know, some of it's kind of like joking about something that's serious or maybe it's joking about just nonsense. I think it can be healthy, help us like develop a tough, tougher skin and but then like some people like that probably get a lot more than their fair share so go you know as the little person still a person and how much does he get to just be a person so when i the title of the show the midget and the man i'm talking about the same guy so you can look at him as, oh, he was a midget riding a mini bike. It's funny. You can say, like, there's a, a man on a bike. And it's not like I didn't notice that he was a, a little person or that he was riding a kid's bike. But I didn't have the same response as my, my friend did. And when I was thinking of how I would talk about this part of it was this internal struggle of how much do I want to distance myself from Josh so I can say no oh what a jerk he's he's not as righteous as me I'm you know I've I've really got it together I'm like this you know zen master and I, I understand I'm intuitive and I have empathy and I can but if I distance myself from Josh who's this jerk that makes fun of little people is that much different than him making fun of that man so I I made it a, a point to say not just this guy I used to work with, but my buddy that, that did that. And I think we all have blind spots. We all have work to do, right? And there's times with um, like the a woman I was seeing, my last major relationship, and we were talking about something kind of heavy and I made some kind of a joke. And I don't, I don't even remember what it was, but, and then she just kind of like, like mocked me like that was a, a really stupid thing to say at that, at that moment. And, you know, the, the whole point of that, conversation was to to tune into her and uh, find out what what was really going on but even though I was trying to play that part I guess I didn't do it as good as I could have I 
I'm going to read from, um, so the first yoga book that I got, I got two yoga books when I was 15 years old at a Grateful Dead concert. I think I've told the story on here a bunch of times. And this isn't, this isn't one of them. Um, if you're on, if you're watching the video, you can, I think you can kind of see it on the screen. Or it might be backwards. Is that backwards? But anyways, it's called The Path of Yoga by Bhakti Devanta Swami Prabhupada. He was, he created the Krishna consciousness movement uh, in the uh, 60s. He was popular with the, the hippies and But when I was looking for stuff to read, this is the first page that I that I turned to. Uh, this is uh, chapter fifteen in the Path of Yoga by Prabhupada. Yoga as freedom from duality and designation. This material world is a world of duality. At one minute. At one moment, we are subjected to the heat of the summer season, and at the next moment, the cold of winter, Indianapolis, that's what we're doing right now, or at one moment, we're happy, and the next moment, distressed, at one moment, honored, at the next, dishonored. In the material world of duality, it is impossible to understand one thing without understanding its opposite. It is not possible to understand what honor is unless I understand dishonor. Similarly. I cannot understand what misery is, is a, if I have never tasted happiness. Nor can I understand what happiness is unless I have tasted misery. One has to transcend such dualities, but as long as this body is here, these dualities will be here also. Insofar as one strives to get out of bodily conceptions, not out of the body, but out of bodily conceptions, one has to learn to tolerate such dualities. In the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna informs Arjuna that the duality of distress and happiness is due to the body alone. It's like a skin disease or a skin itch. Just because there is itching, one should not be mad after it to scratch it. We should not go mad or give up our duty just because mosquitoes bite us. There are so many dualities one has to tolerate, but if the mind is fixed in Krishna consciousness, all these dualities will seem insignificant. How is it one can tolerate such dualities? A person is said to be established in self-realization and is called a yogi or mystic when he is fully satisfied by virtue of acquired knowledge and realization. Such a person is situated in transcendence and is self-controlled. He sees everything, whether it is pebbles, stones, or gold, as the same. Jnana means theoretical knowledge. I think that's actually pronounced like more Ganya. Ganya. My Sanskrit is a little inaccurate. And Vaiganya refers to practical knowledge. For instance, a science student has to study theoretical scientific conceptions as well as applied science. Theoretical knowledge alone will not help. One has to be able to apply this knowledge. Similarly, in yoga, one should have not only theoretical knowledge, but practical knowledge. Simply understanding, I am not this body, and at the same time acting in a nonsensical way, will not help. There are many societies where the members seriously discuss Vedanta philosophy while smoking and drinking and enjoying a sensual life. It will not help if one has knowledge theoretically. This knowledge must be demonstrated. One who truly understands, I am not this body, will actually reduce his bodily necessities to a minimum. When one increases the bent of the body while thinking, I am not this body, then what use is that knowledge? A person can only be satisfied when there is jnana and vijnana side by side. It goes on, but I think you get the idea and where it, how that relates to the man on the bike or everything else that you've ever seen or heard. There's another one in here. The fate of the unsuccessful yogi. 
same book, chapter 16. The fate of the unsuccessful yogi. It is not that Bhagavad Gita rejects the meditational yoga process. It recognizes it as a bona fide method, but it further indicates that it is not possible in this age. Thus, the subject in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is quickly dropped by Sri Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna next asks, What is the destination of the man of faith who does not persevere, who in the beginning takes to the process of self-realization, but who later desists due to worldly mindedness and thus does not attain perfection in mysticism? In other words, he is asking what becomes of the unsuccessful yogi or the person who attempts to perform yoga but somehow desists and does not succeed. It is something like a student who does not get his degree because he drops out of school. Elsewhere in the Gita, Sri Krishna points out to Arjuna that out of many men, few strive for perfection, and out of those who strive for perfection, only a few succeed. So Arjuna is inquiring after the vast number of failures. Even if a man has faith and strives for perfection in the yoga system, Arjuna points out he may not attain this perfection due to worldly mindedness. Uh, I'll leave that at that for now. So the might have gotten a little off of my point, but it's it's all related in the big scheme of things, isn't it? But the idea is not relating to or not um, identifying as this body. So whether we're kind of, I guess, gifted a admirable one, one that people admire or whether we're given one that people feel sorry for or make fun of. And most of us at some point, unless we die early and even then we get, we have the one that people feel sorry for, don't we? I'm in pretty good shape right now. We'll see what the next, how the next 50 years goes. There may be a time when I'm not, You know, maybe a time when I'm not. There's a book or um, uh, from Longfellow that I was reading. I'm going to read uh, two of them from Longfellow. This one's called The Arrow and the Song. I shot an arrow into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. For so swiftly it flew, the sight could not follow it in its flight. I breathed a song into the air. It fell to earth, I knew not where. For who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of song? Long, long afterward, in an oak, I found the arrow still unbroke and the song from beginning to end I found again in the heart of a friend. That one's stupid. I don't like that one. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Whoa, I had another one. Okay. Oft I remember those whom I have known in other days to whom my heart was led as by a magnet and who are not dead, but absent and their memories overgrown with other thoughts and troubles of my own, as graves with grasses are and at their head, the stone with moss and lichen so overspread. Nothing is legible but the name alone, and is it so with them after long years? Do they remember me in the same way? And is the memory pleasant as to me, I fear to ask, 
yet wherefore are my fears pleasures like flowers may wither and decay and yet the root perennial may be i think i read that one before but that one's a good one So I wonder, you know, like when, you know, that buddy of mine, Josh, I wonder like what he thinks about, because, you know, that's one of the main things that sticks out and it's not, um, a positive thing for him, but as the, as what I just read in the path of yoga and the Bhagavad Gita and uh, I guess a lot of other spiritual books would say, you know, there's not much we can do about duality and to understand, you know, sometimes we have to have a bad example to influence us to be good. Or like, Oh, I don't want to be like that. I could see this direct effect, him pointing and laughing. And it, it changed that guy's life. He was having a nice time, great time. And then it, it was taken away. And, and just because some random dude pointed and left. There were other times we had we had fun too. We, we'd go out to, I don't drink anymore, but we'd go out and drink and party and stuff and you know, he, I would say he was a pretty good dude. Uh, and so maybe it's a, a shame for me to remember that thing as the most prominent. But we're all getting, we all get like made fun of at some point, right? I don't think I'm repeating myself here, but there was a time in uh, must have been like middle school, maybe like early high school, freshman year, junior, sophomore year, something like that. Probably maybe freshman, some with something like that. Maybe I was a freshman, and there was this kid that was younger than me, and I was a vegetarian, and it must have been yeah, it must have been like fifteen, because I was already a vegetarian, so I must have been over that. But he'd call me like soy boy, and he'd make fun of my hair. I had long hair and like wavy hair and he was a few years younger than me but he's like making fun of me and like the girls you know my age they, they they thought my hair was pretty cool so i wasn't really too worried about what what this kid three three years younger than me or whatever he was had to say but i remember that 25 years later or whatever it is and that's all i remember about that kid too uh, anyways I think we all have like something that is made fun of. And there was this kid that he kind of pick on me and he was a few years older and this was in grade school. And, uh, I, uh, pour myself some coffee here. Whenever I, would watch TV. I'd see like the show that like the Rifleman. And when the Rifleman was drinking coffee, I liked drinking coffee with the Rifleman. He was like this. If you haven't seen the show, it's it's worth watching. He's like the ultimate good man. Was with his son. It's like late 1800s New Mexico. Carries a custom rifle around. He has to kick some ass and kill bad guys sometimes. But anyways, so there was this, I'm, I'm drinking my coffee. So when you hear me do that, maybe you'll want a drink of coffee too, or whatever you're drinking, sassafras tea or. So I was walking home from school and this kid was, he was always like picking on me couple years older, a few years older, whatever it was. So if, if he was in like sixth grade, I was probably in maybe third or fourth. And 
he'd be picking on me. And then one day I loaded up my backpack full of books, big, hard school books. And I was walking home and sure enough, he started picking on me and I put a whooping on him with the, with my backpack. <laughs> I don't think he, I, don't, I think that was the end of him picking on me, put a whooping on him, beat him, beat him up with my backpack. That's a good story. I like that story. There was um, something from uh, Brands of the Prophet. I'm going to read if I can find it where my bookmark is. Oh, it just fell out. Oh, here we go. I think I might have read this one before also, but this is from, I think I just said it, The Prophet. Khalil Gibran. And then a scholar said, speak of talking. And he answered saying, you talk when you cease to be at peace with your thoughts. And when you can no longer dwell in the solitude of your heart, you live in your lips. And sound is a diversion and a pastime. And in much of your talking, thinking is half murdered. For thought is a bird of space that in a cage of words may indeed unfold its wings, but cannot fly. There are those among you who seek the talkative through fear of being alone. The silence of aloneness reveals to their eyes their naked selves, and they would escape. And there are those who talk and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there, I'm going to re repeat that one. And there are those who talk and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. In the bosom of such as these, the spirit dwells in rhythmic silence. When you meet your friend on the roadside or in the marketplace, let the spirit in you move your lips and direct your tongue. Let the voice within your voice speak to the ear of his ear, for his soul will keep the truth of your heart as the taste of the wine is remembered. For his soul will keep the truth of your heart as the taste of the wine is remembered when the color is forgotten and the vessel is no more. I can relate a lot to this one doing a, a podcast and usually I, I never edit them. They're never edited. I don't edit out the ums and uhs or the pauses between thoughts, the space between thoughts, space between words uh, is going to be a subject. I'm, I, I might talk about that in a little bit or I might do a, a show on it, the space between I really relate a lot to this. And there are those who talk and without knowledge or forethought reveal a truth which they themselves do not understand. And there are those who have the truth within them, but they tell it not in words. So like the, the space between the thoughts, the space between words. And I was talking with um, my, my last episode with Emanuela Pintus. We were talking about uh, the Toastmasters, the, the Toastmasters group. 
and she had joined and she was encouraging me to, she listens to, I think she said she's heard, thought she's heard all of my, all of the shows, all the podcasts, but um, whether that's that she has, or she's just listened to most of them or whatever. But a lot of people are editing out the ums and uhs. And I do try to work on the craft. I try to not use those filler words and, and not just ramble for the sake of rambling. But sometimes, like I just read from Khalil Gibran, sometimes when I'm pushing myself like that, maybe I can think of a way that I haven't thought before which is one of the purposes of the show. And it, the part of this show is to stimulate your thought and then action. So the, I was listening to this audio book. Uh, it was, well, it was like a college course presentation and the professor she was saying that you know it's really not so so bad to say um and uh sometimes it gives the listener a chance to think also and i think there's also part of you know when i'm thinking about the words and and the meanings and and we hear something that's put together really very well, like by a Khalil Gibran or uh, Swami Prabhupada. We already know all these words. I mean, we, I mean, you might not know the Sanskrit or the correct pronunciation pronunciation of the Sanskrit, but you know the words, and they can put them in the order that you just, you haven't thought of them and it makes sense to you in a way that hasn't made sense before. These are, it's it's very interesting. And I, I wonder how much other people think about that and, and work on, you know, the wordsmith, of course, you know, poets and songwriters and, Writers, of course, we're, we're putting a lot of thought into how we're wording things. So maybe it's a good idea for everybody to like try like write write something, like write write out your thoughts. And Jordan Peterson says that you know that that's a good way to develop your thinking is to write out your thoughts. You have an opinion on something, you have a theory, write it out, and then criticize it yourself. What's wrong with that? And then after you criticize it yourself enough or critique it enough, might sound more positive. Then when you present it to someone else, it's more refined. It's just something like pops into your head. He doesn't call that thinking. Like thinking is something that you do after that thought puts it, pops into your head. It's like this space between it lets it like kind of sink in. There's like this moment of, I think Zen is a good way to put it or, you know, where it all kind of like makes sense and it's, you're not putting words together. There's a, a silence, a stillness. And that's where it makes sense. When the guy on his bike was just in bliss, I bet there weren't a lot of words going through his head. He was just in the moment and having fun. And then when my buddy pointed and laughed and he happened to turn his head at just the moment and saw him, then I bet a bunch of words started going through his head.
we we have such an effect on people and i've been fortunate enough as a a trainer whether it's teaching martial arts or strength training to have to see some of the impact that i've had like helping people find their strength and it's really cool when people can do things that they've never done. One of my clients, he's in his mid forties. He got his first pull up and he did it. And uh, he did it like before the set we were doing, we were working on like negative pull ups for a while, you know, starting at the top. Um, so the chin, starting with the chin over the bar, you know, using the steps to get up there and then slowly lowering. And we were about to do, our first set of that for that day and he just grabbed the bar and did a pull up and he's like first pull up ever he, he just felt it I didn't suggest it he just was feeling it and it happened and I said that was the first one ever like never in school or anything he said he didn't think so maybe it was sometime it, um, he said definitely not in college not since college and but maybe somewhere in grade school or high school maybe but he didn't remember ever doing one. Uh, so the impact we have on people, you know, I, I wish all my impact could be positive. There, I guess there's, there's been some negative, whether I, I like that or not. When we, I was going to bring up uh, Diamond Dallas Page. This is a good time to bring him up. So if you're not familiar with Diamond Dallas Page, if you're a yoga teacher, if you're a personal trainer, if you're anyone, really, check out what he's doing. Uh, he did a podcast with Joe Rogan. Uh, that was a good one. So you can spend, uh, I, I don't know how long it was, but it's probably an hour and a half, two hours, maybe longer that he spent there. And look up his friend, Arthur. So Arthur started out, well, he was in the military. And I think what happened was he was, he was at, uh, airborne. I don't know if he was like, but he was jumping out of airplanes a lot. And he, he was all messed up from it. He was really overweight. He was, I think he had broken back messed up ankles, knees, hips, everything, head to toe, all messed up using uh, those crutches, like bra those braces crutches that kind of like latch around the arms and using those and could barely get around like that. And then he finds out about Diamond Dallas Page. Well, he already knew about Diamond Dallas Page. But DDP, Diamond Dallas Page, uh, started a, a yoga program. And it's called DDP Yoga. And so Arthur, who I think he was a wrestling fan, or, or I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but somehow he got in touch with Diamond Dallas Page. And I think he just kind of like, started doing the program and man it it's one of the most incredible transformations because he went from he needs two crutches to walk and not very good at that to being able to sprint without them. He lost, I don't know how much weight, but he lost a lot of weight. It looks like a completely different man. And it shows his, his yoga journey. It starts out like he'd be trying to like steady himself doing warrior two. And so warrior two, it's, it's not that difficult, right? Well, for him, it was very difficult. Couldn't balance. And it showed him falling over. He'd fall down. He couldn't even like keep himself from falling down and he'd fall down and it shows it on the video and then it shows him 
trying to do a, a headstand and he like falls over and falls into the, uh, the cabinet. And he's trying to balance and he falls over and he's, you know, this goes on and on. And you see his transformation into somebody that can sprint. You would look at him and you would not think that was the same guy. Uh, and it's because of Diamond Dallas Page, you know, this wrestler who created this. You know, a lot of it looks like, well, it is yoga. It's called DDP yoga. And he took out like the chanting and the, that kind of stuff. And he did it to heal himself. He had like back problems and he has to do about 10 minutes of, of yoga in the morning just to get going, just to um, get mobile. Cause he's had just bone on bone in his spine and all kinds of injuries from wrestling. And this is like the, if you're not familiar with him, it is the kind of wrestling, like the entertainment wrestling, Hulk Hogan style, the rock, that kind of wrestling. It's brutal, brutal sport. And uh, I took my kids to a wrestling match and we got Diamond Dallas Page's autograph. And when we went up to the table, he looked me right in the eye and he had a big smile on his face. And it looked like he was very happy that I was there. And, you know, this is before I was the <laughs> world famous kettlebell and uh, podcast guy. No, but um, he, so he, he didn't know who I was. Like he didn't know my name, but when he looked at me, I really felt like he was happy that I was there getting his autograph. He looked like he was happy that my kids as individuals were there. And just, it was the way that he looked at me right in the eye and smiled. It was, it was a, it was a genuine smile. I, and some of the other wrestlers there, you know, it's going to be overwhelming for them. Those guys work. They have matches. They might have 300 matches a year and they're just, they're just taking a beating. And then with the traveling and the autographs, it's not hard to understand why some of them may not greet you with a look in the eye and seem like they are happy that you as an individual are there. And that's how some of the other wrestlers were. We got a ton of autographs and a lot of it is just like they're going down the line because they have hundreds and hundreds to do. Uh, and, but when we got to diamond Dallas page, it was different. It was really different. Another different one that I had, that just popped into my mind, there was, so when we, we were in line to get his autograph and there was this guy doing security and he was a big guy and I didn't recognize him, but my, I started calling him Mr. Business. And so my kids and I, we were kind of, I don't know if like making fun of him wasn't quite the right word, but he was there to like do security. And he looked like he was all business. He wasn't smiling. He wasn't, he didn't seem like he was having a good time. He was there for security. And so I started calling him Mr. Business and my kids were calling him Mr. Business. And so we're in line to get Diamond Dallas Page's autograph and I'm looking over at Mr. Business and 
I told my kids, well, why don't you go get his autograph? And so they go over to get his autograph. They were the only ones. Nobody was trying to get Mr. Business's autograph. And Mr. Business got out his Sharpie. And he took his time signing his name just right on our, our program. He really took his time to sign it really nice. And then a bunch of other kids started running up to him. And then he started smiling. Because now he had, he, he was a wrestler, uh, apparently. And he was just there doing security now. So I don't know why he wasn't wrestling then or, or what, but he went from no one getting his autograph, never saw anybody. This was at the end of the, at the end of the event. So we're waiting in line. But once my kids went up, a bunch of other kids started going up too. And then he was smiling and he was doing his autographs and he was taking his time. When <laughs> um, when we're going through this life and we're, we're walking by somebody, when we look at somebody, that can be a powerful ex exchange of energy. You can change somebody's day like that. Somebody can be riding their bike, having a great time. And then somebody reminds them you're a midget on a mini bike. This is funny to me. And then you become a joke. And then you remember all the ridicule. And you remember all the... But Ram Das has a saying. And... I'm not really into gurus and for the most part, they all just kind of like say the same thing. I mean, I read a lot of stuff. I mean, I read from Prabhupada, who you call him a guru. And I, I guess I, I read the stuff, but I don't hold any guru um, to be so you know, above me or anyone else. But Ram Das is He's my favorite, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be talking more about him and, and what he's all about uh, in a, a future episode. But Ram Das has a saying that's like just kind of like treat everybody like they're God in drag, and I like that because. You know, and like Jordan Peterson says, like he's, he says something like, well, I don't know if there is a God or not, but you're better off believing that there is. Your life will be better if you act like there is, act like there's some kind of meaning and, and treating people like that's, that's God in drag. Like here, here's your, uh, test here's your thing and Ram Das has another thing another saying that it's like we're all just walking each other home I'll leave it at that thanks for tuning in